All right, so unfortunately, I was not able to record last night's meeting, so I'm going to do kind of a recap to record for those of you that were absent and unable to make it. So bear with me one moment while I share my screen and uh, we get started. All right, so uh, the purpose of this meeting was twofold. Uh, first, to serve as kind of a mid-year recap, and then secondly, uh, to cover the content that you're responsible for, for going over with your child for the month of January. So we'll just kind of jump right in um, with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I ask for your blessings upon this session. I ask that you be eat with each of our families during this time, that you continue to lead them closer to yourself, um, to give them wisdom in guiding their children so that we may all grow in holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the, name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, so just to reiterate, we talked about this at our initial parent meeting at the beginning of the year, but the, the church is very clear that parents are the primary educators of their children. If you look at the quote that's here on the screen from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2225, it says, through the grace, the sacrament of marriage, parents receive the responsibility and privilege of evangelizing their children. Parents should initiate their children at an early age into the mysteries of the faith of which they are the first heralds for their children. They should associate them from their tenderest years with the life of the church. So at St. Angela Marisi, we are here to support you in your role as your child's primary educators. Uh, rather than thinking of this as a program, I'd like you to think of it as a journey, which we are here to assist you on. Um, in the Catholic Church, there's this term of the domestic church, meaning that just like in the Trinity, it's a perfect unity of persons between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We within our homes are called to emulate that love through a continuous cycle of self-gift to one another. You know, our homes should be little churches, right, where we're fostering these children that we've been entrusted in with in the paths of virtue. Uh, when I was at confession one time, uh, there was this dear Irish priest who was kind of talking to me about my confession, offering some counsel. And he urged me to really commit to making my home this domestic, domestic church. He talked about the medieval tradition of, you know, people who had committed crimes or were um, basically in need of punishment, they would go to the church and they would declare sanctuary and the church would harbor them and it would protect them. And it was less about the sin that the, the person had committed and more about the fact that we're all imperfect vessels and that the church is here to take us imperfect as we are and to help us on the path towards perfection, which is heaven. And so the priest ultimately challenged me to kind of emulate that in my own home, to make my home a sanctuary, a place that was free of judgment, a place that was free of criticism, not because because myself or my husband or my children are perfect, but because we're all imperfect, yet we're striving to create that loving atmosphere. And so through our PSR program, our goal is to really help you in that journey. And we teach and form our children in the faith more than anything through the environment we create. So it's not about any single lesson. It's not about any single program. It's about creating a faith-filled environment for your children. And one thing that I can't stress it to you enough is the importance of beginning by prioritizing mass on Sunday with your children. It's very, very confusing to a child when they're being taught, keep holy the Sabbath, they're being taught that it's a sin to not go to mass on Sunday, and yet their parents are not really demonstrating the truth of that by taking them. Um, so make 
church a priority for your family. And I would encourage you not just to commit to going to mass somewhere, but to commit to a church home. We have found it so helpful with my family to actually um, have a regular mass time where we go. It means that the people that we're attending mass become familiar. It becomes a community of faith. It really makes church feel like home to the kids. And though our behavior is still less than perfect, um, by doing that, by sticking it out, uh, bit by bit, my children's behavior becomes better. Church just becomes part of the fabric of uh, their life. Okay, so like I said, our goal at St. Angela Marisi is to really support you in this process. You know, um, our catechists, Susan and Terry, Renee have done such a fabulous job of really journeying with you in this process. And I hope that you will continue to reach out to them as well as to me so that we can be a resource to you in this process. So by now, you should all be familiar with the monthly checklist that we provide. Uh, there are two versions of the checklist. There's the checklist for a family whose children are going through the program but are not receiving their sacraments of reconciliation and first communion. And then there's the sacramental preparation tract. So on the left, you'll see the checklist for a family just going through the program. And as you can see, uh, what we do is we kind of outline the various activities and lessons that are provided in the parent text. And we encourage you to choose the activities that are most suitable to your children. Um, I've asked direct some of them saying that these are ones that we would like you to complete for sure. And then the other ones you're free to choose. However, because you are your child's primary uh, educator and you know your child far better than I do, if you look say at um, the lesson on baptism, the first step on the way, and you just feel like this is way over my child's head, then feel free to pivot and say, you know, we're not gonna do this activity, we're gonna do this one instead. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a sacramental prep uh, checklist. And you'll notice that the sacramental family is doing only three um, of the family of faith activities, though of course you can always do more. And the reason for that is in addition to doing the family of faith curriculum, you as a family are doing the sacramental preparation. So we're going to go into that a little bit more detail. I'm going to come back to this. Okay, so if you look, um, your family should already have, for sacramental prep families, that is, you should have a mend box. And then next month, you will be receiving the nourish box, which contains lessons designed to prepare your child for First Communion. Like the Family of Faith curriculum, this is designed to be done as a family. So it's designed to bring the family together in preparation for this really special occasion in a child's life. So I'll use my family as an example because my daughter, Anne, and, um, is in second grade. So for her, this would really be geared towards preparing her for her first reconciliation and then later her first reconciliation. But I also have a first grader and I also have a three-year-old who could do these lessons with us. And it's just preparing them a little bit early, you know, getting their hearts prepared for these sacraments. If you look, uh, the boxes contain everything that you need to complete these lessons. So the outlines for the parents, um, all of the crafts, all of the materials. So you can see we've got tokens of the five loaves and the two fish because there will be a lesson where we talk about the Bible story of the multiplication of the loaves. You can see there's a, there's a puzzle that's blank, but then the child will draw a picture on it as part of the activity. You can see there's a pick up sticks game. Um, there's lotion, which there's a lesson where the child will squeeze the lotion onto his or her hand and then be instructed to put the lotion back in the tube, which of course the child can't. And it becomes a very visual way for a child to understand that although our sins are forgiven, there are consequences to our actions. And that's why sin, whether it's venial or mortal is so serious. I also want our sacramental preparation parents to be aware of some upcoming dates. So if you look on January 20th, we have a mandatory sacramental prep meeting for the parents, and this is for PSR families and school families. The first reconciliation is scheduled for February 17th at 630. 
There will be a first communion retreat for both the parent and the child on April 2nd. And then finally, the first communion is scheduled for April 30th. So going back to our checklist, um, you'll see for this month, parents and children are meant to complete uh, session seven, which is entitled Healed. And this is the final session of the men box. However, I'd like you to catch up on previously assigned lessons. Now, if you just got your box, which is the case for one of our families, or you've fallen a bit behind, I don't want you to panic and try to cram seven lessons into one month because that's just not gonna be meaningful for your family or for your child. Um, I want you then to kind of look over the lessons and decide which ones you feel um, are the most important for your family to complete together. Now, the good news is that in addition to this sacramental preparation, your child has been undergoing sacramental preparation each month with our wonderful second grade catechist. So we've been talking to them about what an examination of conscience is, um, the various steps of going to reconciliation, what absolution is, how to confess your sins, all of those things. But it's really important for you as a parent to go over this as well, to do some rehearsing, some role-playing so that your child feels comfortable and ready for that first reconciliation. And then I would really encourage you to begin praying the act of contrition daily with your child so that just like the Our Father or any other prayer, um, he or she can really internalize it and take it to heart again so that they feel ready for the sacrament. And then finally, um, I encourage you to receive the sacrament of reconciliation yourself and maybe to take your child, obviously not into the confessional with you, but uh, to church, because by us modeling it as parents, that makes our children feel a lot less intimidated by the sacrament. And it becomes an opportunity, again, for us to really journey in the faith with our children. Finally, I want to remind you all of the storybook project. So at the beginning of the year, we explained to our parents that we would be doing this storybook activity where you basically purchase a large scrapbook and each month there are designated lessons that would be added to this scrapbook. So if you look at this month's checklist, if you look at number four, there are two storybook activities that are provided for the month of January. One is on Jesus's miracles because we're going to be covering the incarnation this month and talking about how the the miracles, excuse me, of Jesus really reveal Christ's divinity. And secondly, there's one on I am the truth. And so I'm asking you to choose one of these, although of course you can do both, and then to add them to your child's, your family's storybook, I should say. Next month, for our February session, um, we are going to invite all of our families to bring their storybooks and the children are going to have the opportunity to display and kind of do a show and tell, sharing some of the things that they've done in their storybook. Now, again, if you're new to our program or if you've fallen a bit behind, I don't want you to panic and go back and try to cram everything that we've done since we began. Um, instead, I'd like you to concentrate on the activities that we're doing for the month of January. So do the storybook activity for this month. And if you've missed past storybook activities, then do some extra things. So for example, if you do the lesson on epiphany, maybe you and your children draw a king cake in your storybook or draw a picture of the three kings and write a few sentences explaining what epiphany is. Or maybe you put something about St. Paul into your storybook. Um, so there's not really a right or wrong way to do this. The whole purpose of the storybook is to kind of give your family a finished product so that when the year finishes, you can say, wow, this is what we learned about this year through PSR. This is how we grew in faith as a family. Think of the checklist and the curriculum as um, it's meant to give you guidance as a family, but it's not meant to overburden. So it's okay for you to pivot or to change things. You know, we're not assigning a grade. We're not here to judge or critique. Uh, we don't expect it to be Pinterest perfect. We just want to see that your family is growing together in your understanding of the faith. All right, so that's kind of a recap of our program. And so now we're gonna shift gears 
and we're going to talk about our content for the month of January, beginning with this video um, by Bishop Donald Hying on uh, Jesus Christ and the Incarnation. something absolutely astonishing that in this one person Jesus Christ the fullness of God was made human for us as believers we have never gotten over the wonder of the incarnation that God loves us so much that he came to us as one of us that he saves us from within our human experience he comes in our skin and dwells with us to join us to God God falls in love with us and invites us to love him back. The ministry of Jesus reveals that merciful love to all people, especially the sick, the poor, the sinners, those living on the margins, those that the world excludes. Jesus entered into the hustle and bustle of our earthly existence and loves us, heals us from inside our own experience. In Jesus Christ, then, the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity is joined. By becoming one with us, God heals that fundamental divide that separates us from Him. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God revealed to us in our human flesh. with this question, how would you speak of Jesus to someone who has never heard of him? And it's a question that's worth pondering because as your child's first catechist, you are tasked with evangelizing your child specifically, with sharing with your child the love and joy of Jesus Christ. And really, this is something that we're all called to do by nature of our baptism. If you think about Mass, as we come together and we worship our Lord, we received Christ into our very beings through the Eucharist, and then the Mass ends with this great commissioning, 
go forth and share the gospel. And so we, just like the first apostles, are called to go out and share the love and joy of Jesus Christ. Now, this can be intimidating. Um, you know, I, I can't say that I bring up Jesus readily in conversation to strangers because we fear reactions, we fear judgment or whatever it is. But, um, you know, we share the love and joy of Jesus through our actions more than anything, right? They'll know we're Christians by our love and sharing another confession story, so to speak. Um, again, my daughter received her first reconciliation and there's something really beautiful because we as the parent are tasked with sharing Jesus Christ with our children, but in our desire to form our children in the faith, it ends up pushing us and our own faith journey in this beautiful way. And so we help each other along the path to holiness. And so since my daughter just received her first reconciliation, um, I took her for her second time. And so I ended up going again. And uh, because I have five children, ages eight and under, I had my six month old that I was holding as I was talking to the priest. And I shared with the priest really just my struggle to really live out that first commandment, to really put God first in my life, first in my heart. You know, we get so caught up in the busyness of life, whether it's our jobs, whether it's homework, whatever it is that I struggled to make time for that prayer time, that I struggled to have that quality time with God. And the priest who was just so understanding and so pastoral in my confession stopped me and said, wait a second, that's Jesus. And he pointed to my six month old son that I was holding and reminded me that you know, at this stage in my life, at this stage in my motherhood, life is busy. And so that when I focus on my role as mother and I focus on loving my children and forming my children and forming, you know, loving my spouse as I'm called to, that is me loving God. And that can become my prayer and that can become my offering. And so it was very affirming in my vocation as mother, but it was also humbling because if I'm honest with myself, if, if Jesus is my children, if Jesus is my spouse, well, then I haven't really done a great job of loving Jesus lately. And so um, that pushes me, I think, to confession and to Christ even more because I need his help. I need his grace to become the wife, the mother, the daughter, the friend that they deserve. And so that's kind of the, the, the sanctifying journey, right? So January's content, our verse for the month is John 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. And we just celebrated this beautiful feast of Christmas, right? The incarnation. But we've heard the story so many times that we tend to kind of gloss over the details, gloss over how incredible this is that God, the creator of the entire universe, chose to become human. And so we it pushes us to ask this question, why? Why did Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who had everything in himself that he could ever want or need, choose to become human. And I would argue that this is the question. This is the question. This is the conversation we want to have our ch with our children because the answer is what makes our faith so profound. The answer, of course, is God became human out of love for us, right? The gospel story is the story of God living a human life. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, choosing to become human. And so in a way that we can't fully understand, God, who is eternal and has no beginning and no end, becomes human, which of course is finite and has a beginning. And yet the two become one. We believe in Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And we can see the truths of this 
in the gospel story, right? We have signs of Christ's humanity. He ate, he slept. Think about the story in Mark's gospel of Jesus sleeping in the boat and then the storm is going and the apostles wake him up and he quiets the storm. Jesus had emotions. Um, in John 11, 35, I believe that's the story of Lazarus where Jesus weeps. And then we have Matthew 21, verse 12 through 13, where Jesus gets angry with the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple, right? Because they're making God's house a marketplace. He was born. He had a human beginning. And of course, he died on the cross. And that death is only possible, that suffering, that death is only possible because of his humanity. But then Christ shows us to his divinity. Think about Jesus's baptism, which we'll be celebrating soon at Mass on Sunday, when the Holy Spirit descends upon him and we hear God the Father's voice say, this is my beloved son. He performed miracles. Think about the transfiguration where his divinity is revealed to the apostles. Jesus could forgive sins. Think of the story of the paralytic, where the paralyzed man is lowered before him, and yet Jesus uh, profoundly does not heal the man at first. Instead, he says, your sins are forgiven. Of course, the scribes and Pharisees become irate saying, who is this man? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus responds saying, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk. And of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because we can't see that. And so Jesus, to show that he does in fact have the power to forgive sins, says, rise, pick up your mat and walk, and the paralyzed man is healed. And finally, the resurrection. Um, there's a story that I like to tell, um, and it's it's from my own family. I myself am one of seven children, and there's a game that my dad used to like to play with us. And the game would be, he would say, um, Audrey, does, how much does daddy love you? Does he love you this much? And, you know, as a child, we would say, no. Does daddy love you this much? And we'd say, no. And then finally, my dad, who's 6'2", would stretch out his arms as wide as he could, and he would say, does daddy love you this much? And we'd say, yeah. Well, um, again, one of seven children and my parents, we would get to mass really early. We'd be sitting right in the front pew. And so one Sunday, my dad was holding my sister, Claire, who's number five. And he was playing this game with her before church to kind of keep her attention, you know, keep her well behaved. And after he finished, he said, Claire, how much does Jesus love you? And Claire, of course, immediately stretched out her arms as wide as she could and said this much. But then my dad did something a little bit different. And he said, well, how do you know? And Claire's like, well, that's not part of the game. We've never rehearsed that. She didn't have an answer. Um, well, at my childhood parish, there's a big, big crucifix right at the front. And my dad pointed to the crucifix and said, there, that's how you know. And that story has stuck with me because it, it's such a beautiful image. It's almost like you can imagine Jesus saying, I love you this much and stretching out his arms, just like my dad did with me and my siblings as we were young children, and then allowing his hands to be nailed to the cross. God makes his love known for each one of us through his life, passion, death, and resurrection. And then of course, finally, his ascension into heaven. The incarnation, the, the, the gift of the crucifixion, allows us to know how profoundly loved we are. Jesus was born literally to die. That was his purpose. That was his purpose for becoming human. And he did that not because God's a masochist. He did that because we had done irreparable damage through Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, through original sin. And so Christ, out of his tremendous love for us, sacrificed himself so that we could be in heaven with him. This is the great love story. This is our heritage as Catholics. And we want to share this story with our children. Jesus Christ is often referred to as the new Adam. If you think about Adam, he was tempted in the Garden of Eden by a serpent and gave in to that temptation, right? He ate of the fruit of the tree. And in so doing, he brought consequences not only upon himself, but upon all mankind. 
Jesus reverses this. Again, he's tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he was so afraid. He sweat blood, and yet he remains strong. He willingly sacrificed himself on the wood of the cross, and in so doing, he brought good consequences upon all mankind. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And so that's the first step of what you'll be covering with your children this month. And it transitions into a conversation on baptism, which is the first step on our personal way. Jesus tells us in the gospel of John chapter three, verse five, amen, amen, I say to you, not one can enter the kingdom of God without being reborn of water and spirit. There are many foreshadowings of baptism in the Old Testament. Think of the flood where God washes away the evil and sin of mankind by restoring a new creation through the preservation of Noah, his family, and the animals in the ark. Think of Moses with the parting of the Red Sea when the Israelites are literally saved from being killed by the Egyptians through Moses parting the sea and them crossing to safety. And then finally, the crossing of the Jordan River. After wandering in the desert for 40 years, the Israelite people symbolically crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, which they have awaited. All right, so now I have another video for you where we'll talk about this great sacrament of baptism. Mom, we get baptized. Does that mean that lasts forever? Most of us are baptized as babies. How does that make a difference now? How does baptism make a difference in my life? One of my greatest joys as a priest is baptizing babies. You pour the water on the baby's head, you look into the parent's eyes, you put the chrism on the baby's forehead. You can see in the parents just this incredible joy that uh, this baby has been given to them as a gift from God. And in that moment of baptism, they're consecrating uh, that child to God and, and the child is being welcomed into God's family. For us as Christians, baptism is foundational. It's our first encounter with Jesus. And in baptism, we become children of God fully, baptized into the family of the church. We also say that baptism washes away original sin. What does that mean? It means that without that grace of Christ, without that power of Jesus, we'd be left to our own devices and we'd be left to our own sin, our, our own choices um, for ourselves and not for God. So baptism really sets us on that path of salvation. It's that first step forward in, in this life of Christian service. And it's God coming to dwell within us. In John's gospel, Jesus says, those who believe in me and live according to my commands, we will come to that person. We will come to that person and we will make our home with that person. In Catholic theology, we call that sanctifying grace. And it all begins in baptism. The fact that the Blessed Trinity, God himself, chooses to dwell within us as his place of rest, as his place of action in this world. So even if you're baptized as a baby 45 years ago, today, in this moment, you are called to live out the implications of that baptism, to be a missionary for Christ and his gospel. Because baptism changes everything for us. It goes to the very core of who we are, and we become adopted children of God. It's the year of faith. All right, so what does this have to do with the incarnation? Well, as Catholics, we believe that we follow Christ's path through the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is a birth. Think of, again, the quote from Jesus. Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. And water symbolizes birth. Think of the waters breaking when a woman has a baby. Through baptism, we are reborn as sons and daughters of God. 
but just like Christ was born to die, baptism also brings about a death in us, a spiritual death to sin. St. Paul, our saint of the month, tells us in Romans, or are you unaware that we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? The water itself signifies death. In fact, in olden days, baptism was fully submerged. The child or the adult was pulled by their ankles down through the water, symbolizing death because, of course, we humans cannot survive in water. Now, as a mother, I'm glad that baptism happens uh, a bit more gently now, but there was a symbolism to that, right? Because baptism is an act of faith in God. It means that we believe we no longer have to fear death or the hardships that will inevitably come in life because we now belong to Christ and we have the hope of eternal life in heaven. Baptism symbolizes cleansing, right? Water is used to clean and it removes original sin as well as in the case of an adult who's baptized later, any personal sins we may have committed before our baptism. And finally, baptism brings about new life, right? The Holy Spirit, God's very life enters our soul. Water signifies life, right? Nothing can survive without water. And after baptism, the person lives with divine life, sanctifying grace within them. This doesn't mean the effects of original sin are gone. We'll still die. We'll still be tempted to sin. But it means that we have the beginnings of heavenly life inside of us. And as we continue to frequent the sacraments through the sacrament of the Eucharist and by frequenting frequenting reconciliation, that divine life grows stronger and stronger, making it easier for us to withstand temptation. So as a recap, this is what you're responsible for covering with your child for the month of January. Remember, our curriculum is following the creed, and so we're at the section of the creed that focuses in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, true God and true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, right? So we want our child to understand that Jesus is God. He performed miracles during his public ministry to show that he was God, and he came to redeem us and call everyone to the kingdom of God. This great act shows us God's love for us. God so loved the world that he gave his son so that whoever believed in him would have eternal life. Baptism, which we now receive as part of that redemption, forgives original sin and makes us adopted children of God. Jesus made this possible for us to go to heaven by freely dying for our sins on the cross out of his great love for us. Please know that I will be praying for your families this month as you complete these lessons. Uh, I look forward to seeing your storybook projects and some of the things that you've done to the to learn together as a family. And don't hesitate to reach out to myself, to Renee, to Susan, or Terry, should you have any questions or should there be any way that we can assist you. All right, that's everything that I have. May God bless you.